Okay, I think uh, I think we can start. Uh, today I welcome uh, uh, all of you in uh, instead of Stefania, but she, she, she's here, she's connected, but uh, she's uh, busy with uh, another meeting at the same time. Um, so yeah, we are very happy today to have uh, uh, Professor Jenny Zidori from the University of Zurich, who will uh, talk to us about uh, fluor physics and uh, some exciting uh, aspects. Uh, brief introduction. So, Gino Sidori got uh, his uh, PhD from the University of Rome, La Sapienza, in uh, 96. Then he had uh, several postdocs, uh, Slack, uh, CERN, and uh, he has a position as an NFN researcher uh, in uh, the laboratories of Frascati from 2000 till uh, uh, 2014. And since then, he has been a professor at the University of Zurich uh, with a large group. <laughs> Uh, he's uh, well known for his works on uh, many aspects of biological model physics, uh, from flavor physics, uh, uh, such as uh, the formulation of minimal flavor violation, uh, and uh, Higgs physics, uh, uh, etc. Uh, in the last few years, since uh, 2015, he, he and uh, his group has been uh, really focused on the theory interpretation of uh, these uh, uh, B anomalies that he will tell us about today, for which he also got an ERC in uh, 2019. Uh, so uh, I leave the the chair to uh, to Gino. Please, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, David. It's a really a pleasure to be here. Actually, David was one of the the first person person to come to to, to Zurich uh, with me. So, and uh, it really is a, is a, is a pleasure to 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 discuss today about uh, flavor. Uh, and it, I it, it's quite some time I work on this flavor anomaly. On flavor, I work since too long time maybe but on flavor anomalies also work since quite some time so i want to discuss the problem also a little bit in a in a um, uh, yeah kind of historical term because i think uh, now it's quite some time we we work on this project and i think we develop some interesting ideas and i want to guide you through to this idea that have uh, been developed uh, really in a, in a bottom-up approach which i think is, is the nice way to approach uh, when new phenomena appears uh, uh, and we still have a uh, not fully understood. So this is the, the plan of my talk, which uh, I hope is not too long. So I will really first introduce the main problem in paper physics in general terms, and then we will go to, to the anomalies, looking first to the data, and then discussing a possible effective theory interpretation, and finally toward model building. Okay, so let me start. Well, as you know, I guess uh, maybe I don't need to, to repeat that, but we know, all know that we have a beautiful theory that's called the standard model that works very well to describe microscopic phenomena. And uh, yeah, this theory is fantastic. And of course I can spend a long time to discuss why we want to go beyond because of observation like uh, cosmology and so on. But I think there is a deeper argument which is a field theory argument. I think uh, there has been a shift in our understanding of quantum field theory, right? I think uh, already more than I mean, several decades that we think all quantum field theory are effective theories. And the standard model, we don't think is an exception. So we believe the standard model as any quantum field theory is just a, is a corner of something bigger that contains uh, extra degrees of freedom. But this is a, a big shift in, in, if you want, in cultural terms. So we don't think this is the end of the story just by theoretical consideration. It's just that it's the learning limit of something that contains uh, more degrees of freedom. Indeed, we, we, now we all speak about the standard model EFT. And we would like to understand what, what is above in terms of uh, high energy field, which is the ultraviolet completion of the theory. And the main result of the CERN experiment, especially the, 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 the run two of LSE, the, the main result of run one was the Higgs discovery. The main result of run two is that there is a mass gap. So clearly above this spectrum, there is a mass gap. So actually effective theory techniques are very useful because when we have mass gap, we can try to use an effective theory. So we identify the, the long range properties of this effective theory, and we would like to understand that, which is the UV completion. And this, I mean, it's, of course, is a very complicated problem in general terms. Uh, ideally, we really want to understand the, the, the nature of these uh, extra degrees of freedom, but also we would like to understand why this specific structure, which is quite peculiar, I want to convince you of that, uh, emerge at low energy, which is a non-trivial point, okay? Of course, ideally, we would like to do the experiment here on the UV frontier, but we cannot do it clearly for the next 10 years, no way. And so we have to do experiment at low energies, really 
exploring the structure of this EFT. And we can do this at different level. I mean, actually at the high energy frontier of the EFT, like looking for tails in the high energy distribution or looking at high precision in transition involving quarks. It's a very, very large set of information. So I think it's very interesting because there is a lot still to be learned by analyzing in more detail the structure of the EFT. And I think there are two very important type of information that we extract, some of which are already very clear, which is that the fact that the couplings here of this theory are peculiar. We call them tuned, tuned or unnatural. As a matter of fact, they are not all similar. They're very different. And this is an important fact. And then also we realized that also because of this fact, but also because of the specific nature of the disease of freedom, we have several accidental symmetries in this theory. Maybe some even approximate accidental symmetries, but really the set of symmetries we observe at low energy are much more those that you could have expected given the degrees of freedom that you have at your disposal. And I think these are in interesting information that we should not underestimate, which tell us something about this UV completion, okay? I think this is a very interesting general point. So let me be more specific about this. So let's give a closer look to the, a close, close look to this EFT. You see the standard model EFT is the following form. So we have the old standard model, which is, has two sectors, the gauge and the Higgs sector. And what we, used to call the standard model is this dimension four part of the theory. So that is the structure that survive at low energies or at large distances compared to the, to the electroweak scale, okay? Which technically means operator of dimension up to four. So this is, once you tell us which are the long range forces and which are the standard model particles, that's it. And of course there is the extra important ingredient, which is the Higgs that tells you which is the ground state. But then if this is an effective theory, you expect a series of extra terms, which are higher dimensional operator in the EFT language, which are nothing but contact interaction, like generalization of, of the Fermi theory, which is the remnant of all the possible high energy degrees of freedom uh, if you don't have enough energy to excite them. So if you don't have energy to excite them, they look like point-like interaction. Okay, so this again, very general concept of uh, how effective theory works. There is the, the long range structure and the point like interaction. So what we learn from, from these operators? Well, again, we think this structure comes from uh, a projection from UV. So there are extra degrees of freedom and then we project out and we build eliminating the extra degrees of freedom. What survived at low energy is this structure here. But this UV leaves some imprint. Okay, and I think this imprint, uh, I would say are of two type. There is a qualitative imprint, uh, which is more difficult to fully identify, but it's there in the value of the coupling that we see here in the low energy Lagrange in the, in the standard model. Because actually, especially if they are peculiar, they tell us something that the UV is not uh, uh, completely chaotic, okay? <laughs> Otherwise you would expect them all similar. And this is what I'm stressing about this unnatural tuned value of, of the low energy coupling. And then of course, there is a more clear imprint. If you see specific uh, contact interaction, this clearly can only come from uh, the high energy of freedom. It's something that is not described by the standard uh, long range forces. And here to identify these extra pieces, looking at possible violation of the accidental symmetries is a very powerful tool. I'm stressing this because actually this is exactly what these anomalies are about, are violation of accidental. This is really a quantitative imprint of the UV. Well, this is a more qualitative. Now concerning this qualitative, just to make uh, one example, which I think is familiar to everybody. Of course, the, the most notable example is the, the Higgs mass. I mean, the Higgs mass is the only quadratic term in the, in the Lagrangian here, has a, a contribution, which is the, the, the term in the Lagrangian. But of course, then this term is, quadratically sensitive to the possible high energy degrees of freedom. So what we measure, the physical mass is a combination of these two things. 
and of course this is uh, it's not just renormalization okay it's really the dependence on the ultraviolet degrees of freedom which is hidden there in the physical value of the Higgs mass and the fact that we measure a low value tell us in my opinion still it's a clear indication that there should be some new physics uh, couple at least to the Higgs and to the top to stabilize this sector. Actually, the more we push high the new physics, the more this it's unnatural. This is the famous electroweak hierarchy problem. This I think has been discussed for, for decades. We spent a lot of time discussing this problem. However, this is not the main part of my talk. What I want to tell you in this talk actually that flavor physics on the other hand is telling you much more because there are a lot of other couplings here which are peculiar. Maybe they are not unstable like the Higgs mass, but still they are very different one from the other. And this is, I think, is telling us something. And actually, yeah, data seems to point out to some anomalies here, so some evidence of higher dimensional operator. So that's why I think flavor physics is very exciting. And I think in the next few years will be even more exciting because it's really, we have many operators that uh, are sensitive I mean, that control flavor dynamics and also even many coupling here in the standard Lagrangian. So we should not ignore this information. And I think it's our biggest hope to learn something about new physics in the, in the next decade. Okay, so this was just a premise. Let's go deeper to, to, to flavor physics still on, on the standard model side or in this story, standard model EFT side. I mean, it's a, it's a flavor is, is a, all problem, okay? And, and to understand why it's a problem, again, look, let's give a closer look. So on the standard model EFT, we have the gauge sector, which is the more trivial from the point of view of a, if you think of a projection from the UV, because the structure of the gauge sector is completely dictated by the quantum number of your light degrees of freedom. So once you specify how they transform into the gauge group, everything is fixed. You don't have other free parameters. And it is a very natural sector because it contains only order one couplings. What is really peculiar of this sector that we have the three families. So we have three set of fermions field identical from the point of view of the gauge quantum number. So the long range forces, the gauge interaction of the standard model, see these families in identical way. This corresponds to a big symmetry, a, a U3 to the five symmetry, because uh, we can rotate for each of these, this is, these are described by five different fields. And if we can rotate in, in, in the three-dimensional space of flavor, we don't see any difference from the point of view of, of the gauge symmetry. But you know, this symmetry is not exact in the sun model, it's broken by the Higgs sector, and particularly by the Yukawa interaction. The Yukawa interaction is the only one that breaks this symmetry, and it breaks it in a very peculiar way because uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Yukawa interaction is the, the coupling between the fermion and the Higgs. So it's the what gives masses to all the fermion we observe. And these masses are very different one from the other. I mean, from the electron up to the top, we have five order of magnitude. So you see, this is it's true that this hierarchy is stable from the point of view of quantum correction, but it's a big hierarchy. And we, we should not hide this fact. It is, I think it's a clear imprint of something non-trivial happening in the UV. We don't know where, but at some point, the, the, there is something that really distinguishes the different generation. Also, we have this peculiar structure in the mixing, as you know, the, the Yukawa coupling, uh, which uh, this coupling here, not only control the eigenvalues, which are the mass, but also to control the mixing. And in the quark sector, this mixing is very small. So in particular, this Yukawa coupling have a big entries only for the 3-3 three, three element, which is the top Yukawa coupling. A bit significantly smaller is, is the, the one in the bottom sector, but then all the other entries are very small. Like here, the biggest entries in, in the up sector is VTS, which is 4%, and then all the rest is below 1%. So this is, if you want, sometimes called the standard model flavor problem, because we don't have, we would like to find the, a rational explanation why this happened. This, is, this seems to be a remnant of, again, some non-trivial, these are not random numbers, okay? So the flavor texture of the standard model is described by these two properties. We have a large flavor symmetry in the gauge sector and the peculiar breaking from the Yukawa interaction. And combining these two things, we have all these exact and approximate accidental symmetries that we observe in the, in the standard model. Just to make a few examples, I mean, 
individual lepton flavor actually is an exact symmetry simply because the Yukawa coupling cannot distinguish, okay, and it can, can sorry, break the, 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 the flavor symmetry, but leaving unbroken the U1. And there is no way to, to break these just writing this dimension for operator given the, the field content. There are other symmetries which are approximate, like isospin. Again, isospin is an approximate symmetry which comes from the fact that the, the up and down Yukawa coupling are very small. Okay, so and conceptually, these two things are very similar. I mean, they're just due to the fact that we break the flavor symmetry, the flavor symmetry of the gauge sector in a very peculiar way. I, I see a, a, a raised hand. I don't know if you want to do question now or. or uh, I think uh, unless it's a, like a very urgent question, maybe it's better to keep all of them at the end. Uh, okay, just let me know in case uh, you, you control the, you're the boss. Maybe in the chat, if it's something very urgent, we can write in the chat and then. Uh, the chat I cannot see, so this is. No, I, 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 I see it, I see it. So. Okay, very good, in case you, you break me. So I, I want to spend a, a, a few more minutes on this concept of accidental symmetry, which is very important. So what, what are accidental symmetries? There are symmetries which are not, we don't think are fundamental properties of the, of the underlying theory, but emerge accidentally at low energies, or if you want a large distance, simply because we don't have enough variables to describe the violation of the symmetry. Again, in the standard model, at low energies, if I don't look at neutrinos, I don't have variable to possibly describe a violation of lepton flavor. However, if these symmetries are not fundamental properties, you expect that at some higher energy, there are degrees of freedom that eventually violate the symmetry. And these degrees of freedom will induce an effect that will show up uh, via the higher order contact interaction. So looking at this uh, contact interaction, you expect to see violation of, of the accidental symmetries if they are not really good symmetries of the theory. But this effect is suppressed because it's suppressed by, by the heavy scale where, where you can describe the violation of the symmetry. And of course, looking at a violation of a symmetry is very powerful experimentally to, to distinguish a tiny effect from a bulk contribution, which on the other hand is symmetry conservative. So it's a, it's a very powerful way to indirectly access information about the extra disofilm. We know this historically very well because for instance, just to make two famous example, I mean, I always repeat this, but it's, it's important uh, uh, didactically, I would say, if you look at the theory of strong and weak interaction, so sorry, strong and electromagnetic interaction, so QCD and QED, if I built an effective theory of that type, which indeed is the theory uh, that was the beginning, if you want, of the standard model, then flavor was an accidental symmetry, and this accidental symmetry is violated by weak interaction. Indeed, weak interaction in this theory are described by the Fermi operator, which point to a well-defined high energy scale, because indeed this is the only interaction that can violate flavor. So actually looking at the violet flavor, the transition U to D, you could understand that there is a weak interaction. Actually weak interaction has pieces which conserve flavor like the neutral current, and these, these were discovered much later because they don't violate the accidental uh, symmetry. On the other hand, on the, other hand the, the Fermi interaction will discover much, much, uh, earlier because it violates the accidental symmetry and it points to a scale where indeed is the Fermi scale where new dynamics occur. A less trivial example is the standard model with two generations. Here, the interesting accidental symmetry is CP violation. If we write the standard model with two generations, in the quark sector, we cannot write a CP violating a UK interaction. You can always rotate away the phases. Actually, this was the theory basically identified in the 70s. And there, uh, however, there was an evidence of TCP violation. There was a single evidence of CP violation, which was KK bar mixing. Indeed, this at that time could be attributed to a super weak interaction. Actually, it was attributed by Wolf and by to a super weak interaction, which in modern language is nothing but an effective operator of dimension six suppressed by, by heavy scale with a, with a complex coupling because it has to violate uh, CP. Now, this is interesting because if you look at the scale of that, that operator to describe KK bar mixing, uh, actually, sorry, epsilon K, CP violation, this scale is super heavy, 10 to the 4. And this, there is nothing at 10 to the 4. We actually know a posterior that this is the effect of the top and the CK matrix. So, this identification of the scale is potentially misleading. So, I'm stressing this fact because I think when we, when we see 
a violation of a central symmetry, we immediately understand that there is something, some new degrees of freedom, something else. But to which scale these appear, we don't know. We can only put upper bound. So for instance, in the case of the Fermi scale, the upper bound was close, relatively close to where indeed new dynamics occur, which is the, the, the if you want the W mass. In this case, it's a clearly overshooting because this structure is more complicated. And the violation of lepton flavor universalities that now we observe these days in data are exactly of this type, are violation of an approximate accidental symmetries of the standard model Lagrange. So, okay, sorry, before, before going to the, the data, I have to remind you, however, that there are, a lot, there are a lot of other possible violation that we don't see. And this puts very strong bounds or say upper bounds on this scale of new physics. Uh, and for instance, the typical case is uh, again, possible operator that, that uh, contribute to meson anti meson mixing. You know, again, in, in the past decades, we put a lot of strong bound on the possible operator that violate uh, uh, flavor in the quark sector that contribute to Kekar mixing. These bounds are stronger for transition involving the first two generation and become weaker for those involving the, the, the third generation, but still are. are extremely high. And this, again, it looks like a bit of a problem because we would like to have relatively light new physics uh, to address the, the Higgs stability. Eventually now for these anomalies also, we need relatively light new physics. And then we have to cope with the fact that here on the other hand, we have a very strong bound. So clearly this is telling us that the situation is, uh, is uh, non-trivial and we cannot just do everything with a single scale, okay? If you want to, 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 to describe data. So summarizing, I mean, what we see in our effective theory is a uh, summarize here. So we have a big flavor degeneracy, a peculiar breaking in, in the Higgs sector, a series of stringent bounds on this higher dimension operator, and maybe some anomaly. So the big question for your fifth is, are all the accidental symmetries broken somewhere in, in the UV? We still don't know. And especially, I mean, the, the most important question is, can we make sense of the tight bounds that we have on certain operators and at the same time see signal on new physics elsewhere, elsewhere? And I think the nice thing is that recent data seems to provide some answer in this, uh, in this uh, uh, direction. So let's look at the data, the anomalies. I guess probably most of you have heard about them, but uh, let's try to, to, to summarize the situation. So since 2013, I mean, it's a long story now, result in semi-Newtonian BDK is starting to exhibit tension with a summary prediction connected to possible violation of lepton flavor universal. So we seem to observe, observe a different behavior of muons versus electron in transition of the type B2S LL, and a different behavior of tau versus light leptons, especially versus muons, in transition of the type B2 char lepton. These are very different processes in the standard models, so neutral current, charger current. These are forbidden at three level. These are allowed at three level. Still, in this case, we seem to see deviations in the behavior of the leptons. Why we should expect the same behavior of the lepton? Because I mean, this lepton flavor universality is a, I told you, is a, is, a, is a consequence of this universality of the gauge interaction in the standard model. And in the limit where we switch off the Yukawa coupling of, of the leptons, everything should be universal in the, in the lepton species. Actually, this universality is badly broken by the Yukawa coupling because the Yukawa coupling of the three different leptons are very different from 10 to minus six of the electron to 10 to minus two of the tau. However, you see they are all small. I mean, even the tau one is very small compared to the gauge coupling. So dynamically, these are very tiny effect, which we can often neglect. I mean, especially the one of the electron muons, when we go to, to high energy process like lepton emitted by a B decays, you can completely neglect except for small kinematical effect, this coupling here. And this is why we expect a universal behavior of electron muons in the data. But again, is a part of these accidental symmetries of the standard Lagrangian. You see that the only operator that can violate the symmetry violated badly, but uh, so because there is no symmetry at all, but the violation overall is small. But maybe because we, are, we have just looked at the Yukawa sector, maybe in other sector, the violation is bigger. So, Data. I mean, in B2 SLL, we have a high significance of anomalies with several observable pointing to the same coherent picture. I illustrate this briefly. So 
the biggest evidence, the biggest in terms of significance, uh, also in terms of theoretical cleanness, are in these ratios, the so-called universality ratios. So a decay of a, B, a hadron containing a B quark to a different hadron containing a, an S quark and a muon pair. And I look at exactly the same process, but replacing the muon pair with an electron pair. So we, the experimental the collaboration, essentially LACB, has to look at all these ratios and all these different uh, decays, which different from the, 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 the finest, type, finest state hadron. Also, sometimes the initial hadron is different because we also have the, the lambda B, which, yeah, which is in this case here. And the standard prediction is essentially one, except in this case because of a small kinematical effect. And you see that observation is always below one. And there is one case where the significance is high because this is really high statistic measurement. The other case, the significance is not that great in terms of sigma, but they all point in the same direction. Of course, we can combine this and then this becomes a high significance. There is another observable, which is completely independent, which do not involve electron, which is BS mu mu, where here we are able to predict this process precisely in the standard model without with very small theoretical uncertainty. This is the standard model prediction. This is observation. You see now again a deficit of muons with respect to what we, we were expecting. Of course, this alone is not a high significance, but goes exactly in the same direction. Last but not least, there are other processes which are a bit more difficult to compute uh, theoretically. And I will say a few words. Where we, we again observe a deviation from our prediction, which can be all explained by the same type of contact interaction. So how we describe this process in the standard model? Well, these are processes which are forbidden at the three levels. So they are complicated process because we have a hadron going to a hadron. So where there are a lot of non-perturbative effect. In some cases, in some region of the, sorry, this is a, I want to be the invariant mass of the electron pair. We are dominated by short distance dynamics. So we can really use perturbative QCD and compute these things precisely. So there are regions in the phase space where we have can make precise prediction. And these are the regions more sensitive to new physics. There are other regions where long distance dominates. So for instance, charm, rescattering becomes important. Of course, if you go close to the JEP side, this becomes a, a, a problem. So there we have no sensitivity to new physics. However, in all regions, long distance dynamics cannot spoil this property of electron flavor universality. Because I mean, the way to connect the lepton is via the standard model gauge boson, which are Z and, 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 and photon, which are universal. And also long distance dynamics is the one relevant low energy. So the Z, you can ignore it. And therefore, for the long distance part, so you don't modify the axial coupling. So actually, the, the, once you do all this, you generate effectively four fermion interaction of this type in the standard model, uh, with, which are called O9 and O10, these effective operators are the operator that you obtain integrating out the heavy degrees of freedom. And the axial one, so O10, is not affected by, by, by long distance. So this is why there are a series of very precise short distance information that you can extract from data, which are possible tests of non-universality, both for the vector and the axial current, and the axial current alone, which means the observable of visa best to mu mu is, is very clean. So putting the things together, looking only at the clean observable, so those for which you don't have to care about uh, estimating precisely on long distance, you have a, a high significance. You, you can combine this ratio with a visa best mu mu. There is a very nice consistency, and we are far from the standard model point. Actually, if you assume that mu physics is purely left-handed, so this delta C9 means a, a, a modification between mu and electron opposite between a, a vector and axial current, which is a pure left-handed interaction, then the hypothesis is comparing this hypothesis that there is a, a new interaction left-handed uh, uh, involving new ones only, you get a five sigma difference between this hypothesis and the standard model, which is remarkable. Of course, there can be other hypotheses. And so overall, there is some look elsewhere effect, but still the significance is high. Now, if you also take into account uh, the other observable, those where they, you are sensitive to charmer scattering and you try your best to estimate charmer scattering, you see that to describe the data, you also need a universal shift to C9, so to the vector current. So universal means the same for electron muons. And then the significance blows up. Of course, here 
I don't want to say what is the significance because I was really, I need to make a much more precise estimate of how well we control charmless scattering, which is difficult, but certainly significant. So you see the very nice consistency. This, this band here is the band on the clean observable. This ellipse is the band of a completely different set of observable involving mu and only, like the angular distribution, the branch ratio, they intersect precisely. And, and now we are really far from the standard model point. Now, if you really want to play the devil advocate, forget about any observable which could be sensitive to the charm of scattering. So don't try to, to, to optimize your prediction just to be as conservative as possible. Also, you try to probe all possible new physics hypotheses of short distance origins or all possible for fermion operators. Still, the significance is 4.3 sigma. That's, that's the exercise we did uh, one year ago, which is really a high and robust significance. Then very briefly, the other set of anomalies in BDKs, which are anomalies in the charged current. So B to char lepton neutrino. This other type of process. Here, data seems to point to an anomaly in process involving tau. So again, the, the, the trick is to look at ratios, process with tau versus process without tau, so with muons. So you cancel most of the hadronic uncertainty, so you get relatively clean standard model predictions. There are different results, which are somehow summarized by this plot, which is a, a bit dense, and sometimes the message is lost because this experiment seems to be very different, but actually, once you take into account the correlation, there are also this band are also experimental result. Overall, the consistency of the experiment is good, is 30%. This is the standard model point, at least the most uh, universally accepted standard model point. And then there is a three sigma excess over the standard model because this is the average of the experimental point. I should stress there is some controversy here. There are different theoretical groups that quote a higher or smaller significance because there are still residual uncertainty in this uh, uh, form factor here. But no doubt, I mean, that some anomaly is there and because all the, the experimental data goes in, in one direction. Maybe it's only two sigma, but maybe it's more. I think three sigma, <laughs> from what, what the, I, my understanding of the data, it's, it's a good compromise to summarize the, 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 the situation. Interesting enough from the theoretical point of view, if this is described by new physics, it would be well described by a left-handed interaction, okay? Like in the case of the new anomaly, the leaving effect, because left-handed would let you move along this, this way. So these are the two experimental results, RD and RD star. Okay, so now having introduced the data, let's start indeed in a bottom-up approach to see which type of effective operator I will need to introduce to describe the data. So EFT interpretation of these anomalies. For the moment, we see anomalies only in semi-electronic operator, and we definitely need the left-handed type interaction. If we want to describe both set of anomalies, the B2S mu mu and the B2S tau nu, we see that we need a coupling which is uh, small because it has to compete with the standard model loop level in the B2S mu mu. And you see here, I have a, a process which involves one third generation field and three second generation field. In the case of B2Charm tau neutrino, on the other hand, I have one third generation field and, sorry, three third generation field and one second generation field. So if you want to put the two anomalies together, and I know that some people are skeptical because here the significance is not so high, but on the other hand, it's very nice that, first of all, these two things are very similar conceptually. And also, they really goes well with this idea of something large for the third generation and smaller, the more you put more second generation field, which offer theoretically really a nice link to the pattern, a similar pattern that we already observe clearly in the Yukawa coupling of our theory. So it's not something that we invent, it's there is already very manifest in the Yukawa coupling. This is why I think it's definitely worth to take this into account. So precisely on, on what we see. Again, data, data point to operator of this type where we, again, couple quark and lepton <clears throat> with different flavor. 
let me consider this basis of operator, okay, where uh, I put i, j is the flavor of the quark, alpha, beta is the flavor of the leptons. So the operator for which we have the highest significance is this operator, b, s, mu, mu. So I call this coupling c, l, l, 2, 3, mu, mu, because I have second, third generation of dumb type quark and then the, the mu ones. This is the one that predicts this shift in C9 opposite to C10, this, this band here, for which I determine from the clean observable in B as mu mu. <clears throat> the size of the operator is 4 10 to the minus 5, the Fermi scale. So it's a sort of new super weak interaction. Very nice, exactly what you would expect from generic evaluation of accidental symmetry, a super weak interaction. Now, if I want to describe also this universal shift that we seem to observe in C9, force for which the significance is weaker, because you see, while the difference of this band from one is, is the one that is more than four sigma, on the other hand, here on the vertical band, the, the error are, are bigger. Still, if you want to describe it, <clears throat> I can describe it exactly by the same set of operators, but considering taus instead of muons, and then closing the tau loop and generating a universal correction to mu and the electron. So here the coupling I would need is two, three, tau, tau. Of course, I can do this directly with, the, with other type of operator, but it's nice that I can do it with the same set of operator. Because once I, once I have identified clearly one type of operator and identify this clearly from this clean observable, then the underlying mediator is likely to generate also copies of this operator with different flavor, exactly like we observe in the standard model. I mean, the Yukawa coupling appear in all the flavor. So I think it's natural to explore the same type of operator to describe the different observable that we have. But there is a even more interesting reason why I use this operator to describe this universal shift in Sinai, that this two, three, tau, tau, this operator was naturally connect to the charger current alone. And indeed the size and the need of this operator was predicted. We, we had it when we were analyzing charger current uh, anomalies actually with, with, with David, uh, uh, admin and other collaborators. We didn't realize that this effect was important uh, in the, in the bitwise LL, but we realized that we really needed to describe the charger current anomalies. Because need, and uh, clearly this coupling has to have a much bigger this operator must have, must have much bigger coupling to impact the SLL <clears throat> because it appears with a loop effect. But this is actually going in the direction of having something bigger when we have more third generation field because near we have two tau field. So indeed, you see, look at the scale here. The scale is 10 to the minus five. You see uh, here is 10 to the three, 10 to the minus two. And here is 100 times bigger. Now let's go to the charged current. In the charger current, since I've chosen my basis to be the one of the down type quark, I, if I want to describe this B2 char tau neutrino, I can head a start from a 3 3, which means BB, and then do a CKM rotation and get BCB, or I start from a 2 3, and then I do a CKM rotation, but in this case will be VCS involved. So I will have a combination of operator because I've chosen my basis to be the one of the down quark. So I have a band here in terms of these two uh, coupling here. And I cannot go to arbitrarily high value of these operator here, which involve only third generation field because otherwise I hit bound from, from direct searches at high PT. So I have to live in this uh, parameter space where the natural normalization of these two operator is again, is a factor of 10 from the operator that has only third generation field to the operator that has a single second generation field. And this is what the data where I describe well the data. The nice thing is that this operator was the one that I already introduced before to discuss the, the neutral current anomaly. So I can put the two things together. So from, from this plot here, I extract my preferred value for, for B to SLL and the two overlap very nicely. Again, this is remarkable, okay? The error are still sizable, so, but are completely different effect. And the fact that the two goes together, for me, it's also one of the very interesting message why again why I want to look at both these anomalies together because there seems to be 
described not only by the same type of operator, but there's really a, a, an interlink and a consistency of the data. So the, the, the pattern I'm managing is something big for third generation, something smaller by factor 10 to minus one when they put the second generation field and something, again, I pay a factor 10 to minus one, each time I put a second generation field. So I mean, let me illustrate this maybe better by, by this uh, sketch here. So I start everything, the data, the clean data are on this B2S mu mu. And I identify this operator from the clean observable in B2S LL. Here really have a high significance. Then my hypothesis is that this comes from a, something big in third generation. So here, the effective scale that I identify from this operator is not the real effective scale because there is a suppression because I have several third, second generation field. So the original scale should be much lower the one involving only the third generation. This operator actually can contribute to B2 charm if I do a CKM rotation. Here we have left-handed field, so clearly the CKM rotation will give you a contribution here. But actually, this is not enough to describe data in RD. I need also the other piece, which is the B2S tau tau, which where I replace a B with the S and therefore I place 10 to minus one. Of course, I can also replace B, not only the, the S, but the tau and, and get the mu and finally I get here. So you see, this is a nice flavor hierarchies. Each, each time you put a second generation field, they pay 10 to minus one. And these two operators here <coughs> contribute to describe well the data in, in RD. And actually the same operator also describe this universal shift in B2 SLL with these two effect alone are not highly significant, but it's nice that they fit together in this nice theoretical organizing principle. Last but not least here, I finally have a scale which is quite low involving only third generation field. So naturally this open up the possibility of stabilizing the Higgs sector. Actually till very recently, I would say this is still a hope. Also, we should see something in Tau Tau, which we have not seen yet. Now, recent data, they don't, we don't have an evidence of Pito Tau, but let's say are not so pessimistic, maybe as we were before, we, we don't have an anomaly, but we don't have a too strong bound that we could have had from, from, from high PT. So it's, it's very nice. Also, again, all the ideas have been revived here to address the Higgs sector. I mean, Higgs as a, as a number goes on boson of the new dynamics. So I think it's, it's a very promising, interesting role. I, I describe it as an exciting uh, narrow path because it's really, uh, we have to, we have a lot of bounds that we have to, to avoid. Uh, and for instance, here, this people tau is, is a strong constant for, for the moment is not uh, killing the model, but we are close to the border. It is very nice because really connect these old problems, the Higgs, the flavor structure, with, with these recent anomalies. And that is the part I want to continue in the, in the rest of the seminar. But before continuing, let me tell you that, of course, this is not the only option. Okay, we have to be very clear. In particular, I think uh, recently there are various people considering alternative stories. And I, I want to mention one, which indeed I think is an interesting possibility, which of course is just to take these B2S new anomalies, which are very clean, and try to put them together with the muon G minus two anomaly, which is a, a completely different type of operator, which however also involves mu one, but it's a currently flipping operator. This is possible. And now, for instance, okay, if you, maybe these two operators, if you, if you normalize in that way, which is a not too crazy normalization, they point to the same scale. And of course you ignore completely the charge of current anomalies, which because maybe you say, okay, these are more uh, uncertain. I, tend to agree they're more uncertain, but I think the story is more complicated here. And what, what I don't like is that uh, here the flavor story doesn't work well, because if I look at mu 2 gamma, here is exactly the same operator here. So instead of having mu right, uh, uh, mu left, I have mu right E left, it's exactly the same dipole operator contribution to G minus two, but now with the flavor violation. And here, I don't see anything. I have to put a very, very strong bound on the flavor violation, 10 to minus five which I don't know where it comes from. So it seems to point to an exact or let's see, very almost exact symmetry in the lepton sector only because in the quark sector, we have violation of flavor. So this, if this is true, I don't know, seems to point to a difference between quark and lepton. Indeed, all the model which we proposed, actually there is a long literature. Sorry if you don't see your name here, there is a big list. Clearly you can do that only if you assign a special role for muons or maybe all muon and taus 
compared to the other frameworks, which I like less because I, I like to be more democratic on the on the on the framework. So let's go back to the to the old path. I go to the narrow path, and let's start to do now more modelability consideration. So how I can justify, I mean, this peculiar structure that we observe with this, this link to the Yukawa Kappa. Okay, if I, I, we really have to, to, to build the model now, okay? We identified what, what the AFT tell us. Now, if you want to go to where a model, we have to specify which is the flavor structure and which are the mediators. Let me start from, from, from the flavor structure. And here again, I have to open a, a, a historical parenthesis because I think it's, it's important to see the, the shift that these anomalies uh, uh, imply in, in, in model building space. The old paradigm in flavor physics, whenever we were trying to, to, to discuss flavor violation beyond the standard model, it was this uh, minimum flavor violation idea that is, okay, we want to have some new physics around, not too far from the literal scale to stabilize the Higgs sector, but then to cope with the tight bounds in flavor physics, we were thinking, okay, there is a, a flavor blind dynamics. That is the origin of the Yuka coupling is postponed to extremely high scale. So the, 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 the concept here was this universality of the gauge interaction is really a deep property that we want to keep up to very high scale. Also, it has to be respected also by the dynamics which appear here well above the letter we scale. So the concept of three identical copies up to energy was implicitly built in. These anomalies tell you that that's not the way, okay? We really have to break the universality. And the best way to do it, if you want in a dynamical way without playing with the, with the approximate symmetries and ad hoc construction is to assume a multi-scale structure, which actually is, is a, old idea, which was put forward before the anomalies, which I mean, now really has been revived with, with this anomaly. So the idea is that there are different layers in our EFT. And at the different layers, the different standard model families get in contact and interact with new physics. And this explain a posteriori the structure of the Yukawa coupling. So the, the, the light families, are light because they interact with new physics at higher scales. And so this interaction is the one also responsible for the generation of the Yukawa coupling. And this is why the, the Yukawa coupling of these families are suppressed. While it's only the third generation which interact with new physics at a relatively lighter scale. And actually in this, these anomalies are the front end of some non-trivial dynamics related to this scale, which involve essentially the third generation. So to, to put this idea in practice, what, what we, we really have to, to do an effective theory here at this scale. Well, at this scale, what happens is that new physics couple mainly to the third generation, and then there is only small mixing to the light generation, in particular to the second generation. So this is give rise to an approximate symmetry that we call U2 flavor symmetry, which again is an idea that, an idea that was put before, put forward before the anomaly appear. And it's nice because it justify a posteriori the structure we observe in the Yukawa coupling. So this approximate hierarchy that we have, this sorry, strong hierarchy that we see in the Yukawa coupling is not accidental, is a, is a remnant of a multi-scale structure in the underlying theory. And the, the, the anomalies really point to now seeing some excitation here of the new dynamics. Now, which type of dynamics? And we don't have many possibilities. If you want to follow this narrow, what I would say, exciting part of explaining the two set of anomalies. Because we have to do the things at, at the three level, because I told you the effective scale in one third generation is, is light. So we have only generator, I mean, uh, mediator of this type, like W prime, C prime, or laptop work. Now, remember what the data were telling us. The data were telling us, okay, we have this nice consistency. We cannot go to too high value of this 3-3 coupling because we hit uh, pi beta to tau. So, the pattern emerging from data was this nice 10 to, man, 10 to minus one hierarchy for each type I put a second generation field, nice consistency of anomalies, but we don't see four core cooperators. Okay, four core cooperator, we have no evidence. Remember the tight bound from Kikabar mixing, Bieber mixing. We don't have four lepton operators. We don't need them, okay, four lepton operator, like an operator contributed to tau to mu. Also the structure of the, 
of the of the uh, semitone competitor we see is peculiar so for instance we don't have want to have something too big in b2s to new we want to have b2 char tau new but not b2s to new so all these effects first of all we have to be careful because actually if you start with something semitonic you generate it at the one loop level for instance you generate a four quark operator at the one loop level from a semitonic operator but you get a loop suppression also, you, you generate a, a, a <coughs> semi-leptonic, sorry, pure leptonic operator start from a semi-leptonic one, again, closing the loop. And these actually are this bound that you see here, which cut a significant part of parameter space. So again, I want to stress this fact that the, the, the path is narrow, but there is a region which is allowed. And of course, here, if you want to estimate this precisely, you really have to specify your UV completion because you see you start to have a dependence on the cutoff of your EFT. But the key point is that you don't want to have any of these as three level. And so these point to leptoquarks. Okay, because leptoquark is perfect. Give you a semi-tonic operator at the three level. Remember, here you have this at three level, but you don't have two for quark or for lepton at the three level. But there's been a, a renaissance of, of leptoquark model recently to explain the anomalies, but, but not only. Here, here, I don't have time to discuss all of them. There are a lot of which have very interesting uh, properties, especially this one of scalar leptoquark as a, a number goes on boson. I think it's a very interesting idea, but the, the model I, I work at myself, and I still consider probably the most interesting one is the one related to vector type leptoquark, because this is a very nice feature that can generate the three level only the two anomaly we observed, which, okay. It's so nice not to be taken seriously. And at the same time, fit these vector mediators, which is the U1 leptoquark, fit perfectly in the Patislam group, which is very nice for, for model building consideration. Actually, this is this type of model. As you see here, sorry, I'm, I'm going probably a bit fast now because I have many things I want to say. You see, in this paper by, by the Orsay group, uh, they classify the different uh, leptoquark and to see which anomaly can address. And there is only one that can address easily both anomalies and this, this U1 field. And this, actually, this was a model that we proposed with uh, Riccardo Barbieri and, and collaborators already uh, seven years ago. And I think we identified all the key ingredients, this, this mediator, the flavor structure, and the possible UV completion in SU4. And I think this is really the good starting point, my opinion, to, if you really think these anomalies are both there. Now, several years passed, and now we can do we can make much more refined analysis of this model because now we really have a, 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 a working model. And this actually, I show you the result of a very recent analysis where we okay try to take seriously this U1 mediator. We couple it to quark and leptons with generic coupling, but imposing these uh, flavor hierarchies. Uh, but of course, we leave the, the coupling free, and then we describe all low energy data. We try to fit all the energy data, including all the effects that generate uh, beyond the three level, like this correction to, to tau decays and so on. And you see that you can describe very well the anomaly. So the correction to RD, RD star, you see this is what you predict in this model, which is very good in agreement with the, with the, with the observation. Also, these are the effect in the uh, leptonium universality test in, in, in B2K, RK, RK star. We can have or not have retended current, which is this term here. In both cases, the, the fit is, is good. The most important part is that this fit is done using only low energy data, and then you get a prediction for high energy. So you predict this signal. Okay, the, the leptoquark has changed in 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 proton proton collision from B quark in in the proton. Actually, this was identified first by uh, the, 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 the Ljubljana group. And okay, actually, this is the updated prediction using, using the uh, present data. And you see, this is the region that was excluded by, by Atlas. Now there is this uh, one sigma hint, okay, by CMS, which, okay, should not be taken seriously as, as a hint, but indeed, this, this, if you want, this was the expected exclusion region. And they, since they see there is slight excess. If you want the preferred region by the anomalies is not excluded at all. So I think it's, it's very interesting, not because of, of the anomaly, but the fact that okay, the, the model is not yet ruled out. And on the other hand, you see that uh, 
with more data now in the run three, and even more with the high luminosity phase, actually this is the projection for the high luminous phase, you will be able to rule out this option. Okay, so it's something clean, testable. Of course, you also expect other things in other low energy observable, especially these lepton flavor violation, like B sub S to tau mu, tau to mu phi, a big enhancement in B2K, all these things, most of which are within the reach of, of future high energy experiment. Now, I'm probably late, but okay, I cannot resist to say a few things about the UV completion. David, please tell me if, if I'm too late, but okay. Maybe a couple of minutes, five minutes at most. Six. Let's negotiate six minutes, okay. So I think I told you, SU4 is the nice group to, to start with because it's uh, because the, this laptop work that you want sits in SU4. I mean, if SU4 is the group the proposed by Patrick Salam to unify uh, color and uh, and uh, what to unify quark and lepton. Okay, so lepton is seen as the fourth color. And if you break this group to SU3, which is color, and you break it to SU3 times U1, then you have the laptop work sitting here as generators. And this is the laptop work that you need for the anomalies. The point that this group has no flavor, okay? So then this laptop work would be flavor universal, and this is not what you want, okay? Because for instance, you are completely killed by Kelon to mu e, so because you have a, an effect of this type. So how to address the flavor structure? Well, the way to do that is to enlarge the group. In my opinion, the best option is to enlarge the group instead of having SU4, SU4 times SU3, where color is the diagonal subgroup, and the idea is that this separation is flavor dependent. That is, SU4 is felt only by the third generation, while SU3, or if you want another SU4, is felt only by the first two generation. This is very similar to, if you want, the, what happens in the electroweak sector where we have electromagnetism as diagonal subgroup. So here the separation is between, it's in chirality, okay? It's SU left, SU to right. And you have a diagonal subgroup. Here you have a separation in flavor. And this happens at the retro scale. This, on the other hand, should happen at higher scale. Of course, this is the, the, the basic idea, which is based on these SU4 so called 4 3 to 1 models, which actually will be discussed first by uh, this group here. And I think there are many ways to, to, to go beyond that, I mean, to really make a, 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 a full theory. Uh, again, I don't have time, just have to, to flash my latest development here, which is this idea of a, of a full theory of flavor and the electroweak symmetry breaking, so stabilization of the Higgs in extra dimension, where the idea is, is really a, a, a variation of the partisan gauge group in the extra dimension with two key concepts. Okay, so again, we have an SU4 times SU3, non-universal symmetry in, in the bulk, and then we have the fermions, which are localized on different uh, position of the fifth dimension. So flavor is still is a, if you want, is characterized by a position or like a topological defect in the extra dimension. So this is the first key point of, of the construction. And on the infrared brain, you have essentially the, the, the third generation, which is of course, strongly coupled to the, to the Higgs. And what, what is the Higgs? Well, the Higgs is a, to protect it, to explain its light mass, you describe it as a pseudo number Gaussian boson arising by the same breaking mechanism that break SU4 trans SU3 to SU3 color. At the same time, here we, we buy the simplest uh, composite X mechanism, which is SU5 to SU4, and then we generate the Higgs as a Gaussian boson. So the, the Higgs has to emerge as the Gaussian boson of the same dynamics that breaks SU4 times SU3 to SU3 color. There can be many other options. So I don't want to say this is the only option for this is the minimal and, and quite appealing one. And then, I mean, if you really do the, the calculation correctly, I mean, the, the, the picture works. I mean, the, really you can describe the mixing in terms of this distance of the brain. And you, you have a theory that goes up to, you see here, the the extension of these, the separation of this, this brain is characterized by the flavor hierarchies. So you go up to 10 to the five TV. So really the, the again, it's nothing but an explicit realization of what I was telling you of this multi-scale picture where 
there is some new dynamics at the TV scale, so related to the to the excitation of this bulk here, which break this SU4 cross SU3 to SU3 color, and doing that generate a Higgs as a boson boson. Okay, just to I have to, to flash because I don't have time. Let me tell you that these models you get prediction, okay? And you now you can compute also the observable, which are more difficult to compute, like big bar mixing or B2K non bar, because these are observable which are not generated at the, at the three level and are also quadratically are, are quadratically divergent in a pure EFT. So here you lean in the model to compute them. So in this case, you can compute them. And I think the situation is pretty interesting. So considering B2K non bar, again, this you don't generate a three level by this U1 left core, but you generated one loop level. Same is true for B sub S mixing. Here, you, in the case of B2K no bar, you unambiguously predict an enhancement. So the sign is fixed by, by RD. So this is the, 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 the type of enhancement you expect. So 20%, 40% enhancement compared to the standard model. So this is normalized to the standard model. In the case of B sub S mixing, since we don't see big deviation to delta B sub S, the only way to, to keep it small is to have relatively like vector like fermions that enter in this loop and work as an effective cutoff. And so lower the effective cutoff of this amplitude here. And so the prediction is that the vector like leptons, if you want the pattern of the tau have to be light to not to have more than 10% correction to, to, to be sub this. You see, if you want 10% correction to be mixing and you want to describe delta RD, then you see you need a, a, a vector like lepton around uh, below one TV. And the interesting data, okay, which came out, okay, here in the case of B2K no bar, we don't have yet a measurement. Uh, it's not even a two sigma excess, but okay, the present data by Bell certainly do not exclude an enhancement uh, of that type. More interesting here is, is, a, is a signal, again, still to be taken with very, uh, a lot of uh, uh, precaution because it's a, it's, it's a complicated thing. But again, a signal of light, vector light lapse recently uh, has been put forward by, by CMS. Okay, and with these uh, exciting things, I, I conclude. Sorry for being late. I hope I gave you the, the message of flavor is really an essential ingredient to understand the structure of the SMEF. And this statement, uh, we, we can already deduce it by the structure of the UFA company, which we to often tend to ignore, but of course is strongly reinforced by, by these B anomalies. And this is statistically significant because the anomalies is, is growing. Uh, the more new data are collected, the more the significance goes up in a rather consistent way. And the chance that this is a pure statistical information seems to be really marginal, especially in the case of B2SLR. If combined, of course, is a big if. So if we combine this church current and neutral current, uh, these two set of anomalies really point to non-trivial fluid dynamics around the TV scale involving mainly the third family, which really seems to be connected to the, the, the origin of flavor. And this multi-scale picture is to me very, very interesting. As I told you, that is a narrow path. So we, there is no contradiction with existing low energy data, but the new sound effect should emerge soon. And so this is a very interesting positive message, especially for the, for the new run of LAC. Both at high energies and that energy. So I think there is still a lot to, to explore, to dig in the data and to see if these ideas are at work or not. So I think it's a very exciting. Thank you. Sorry for, for being a bit too slow. <laughs>
I, so I, I think we expect uh, really soon, hopefully some update both on B2B SLL and on the B2C. Of course, this will be, I don't think this will, well, I think on the, on the charged current anomalies, hopefully this is, which is the more delicate one, uh, the one which is less uh, um, uh, solid, this would be really important. I think it's a very difficult measurement. The very, and so I think LCB will provide something uh, maybe by, by the summer, I, I think. What is very exciting is that Bell 2 now is, is progressing well. And I think by this summer, Bell 2 should have accumulated a similar data set uh, equivalent to the one that Babar had uh, uh, before closing, which for this will need to be analyzed. But I think maybe in two years from now, I think we will know much more about the charge of current anomalies. And this is nice. Of course, ideally, we would like to see something different. And for that, I think the biggest hope are also the IPT experiment at CERN. I mean, the progress is, uh, is uh, slow there, but I mean, we have to, to see because basically results now presented are based on the full statistics of, of uh, RAN2. So before, but I think by, by, by end of RAN3, I think we will have a lot of more information on, on the, on the also on IPT. So especially if the charter anomalies are there, I think uh, in, in five years, I think we will have a significantly more convincing picture if they are there or we can possibly rule them out. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Andre, uh, can you unmute yourself or should I do, do something? I should. Andre, we, we don't hear you. You're mute, you're mute. You have to, to, to remove the mute. I made you co-host because I don't know how to unmute people. <laughs> I cannot unmute you. I think, yeah, we cannot uh, unmute. He has to unmute himself. Uh, there is a, yeah, the microphone oh, icon. Now I got it. I got uh, uh, so First of all, very nice talk. I uh, would like to make a comment, which is somewhat related to your talk. And this is based, uh, I was struck by this 2.3 uh, sigma for b sub s 2 muons. And I would like to make a comment which would, maybe could be interested generally for the audience. And this is based on the latest paper with Elena Venturini, which appeared last week. And this is the following. There is this problem with VCB, as we know, inclusive, exclusive, very big differences, and uh, there will be maybe progress. But uh, before that, before you start anything, you, you could make a very simple exercise and you uh, don't need any computer. You can use, I hope you see it, this is my computer. And uh, <laughs> what you can simply do is to calculate from epsilon k delta ms delta md pcb as a function of uh, gamma and beta. There is nothing left, U, US is unimportant. And you find the, the following, which now I'm praising lattice people. If you, if you, do, if you uh, do, okay, B sub K in epsilon is what it is, is pretty um, well known. But now the issue is what you do with uh, B sub S mixing B sub D mix. Now the dramatic differences, which to my surprise are not even known to CKM fitters and partly even to Luca, who is sitting in the audience, maybe now it is. If you take three flavors, there is total inconsistency between epsilon k and so on. You can plot the, you will see it in the last paper with, uh, uh, with Elena. Ages, which I did with Bob at some time ago, and it led to 2.1 sigma, for instance, B sub S to 2 muons by studying the ratio. And Luca is better than CKM fitters because they, this is, I don't know if Ligeti is sitting in the audience, but PDG is using three flavors and CKMs, which they quote, are totally wrong. I don't understand. Then comes after this main from CKM Fitter something from Luca, and this is better. Luca is, of course, better. Now, the thing is, but now we found a very interesting thing in the last paper. If you take four flavors from HCT, everything works. Epsilon K, 
delta ms delta md are consistent with each other. And what happens? What is maybe most interesting that p sub s to two muons anomaly goes to 2.7 sigma. Ah, fantastic. Fantastic. So this so is in, in the last two weeks, I was in committee. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. So this is the last paper, paper, and I think I, this is uh, two this is things fantastic. I think very interesting and maybe scary that with four flavors, and you, you have to include charm at some stage, there is perfect agreement between epsilon k, delta ms, delta md. You can even find gamma, which is 64.5, which agrees very well with LHCb, and the VCB is a bit higher what uh, Paolo Gambino are telling us. So this is uh, what I wanted to say that I think, and then comes the question, <laughs> what did you, <laughs> what did you use? Because of course, RK, RK star, fantastic, are independent of VCB. But if you do what some people say, you have to do all this uh, big feed by Asian frequencies and so on, at some stage, you have to decide what is VCB. And, uh, and uh, you know, <laughs> so my suggestion was always forget what Gambino is talking about. If Paolo is saying, I, I apologize, <laughs> what Flack is saying, and to do what I suggested many years ago and extended with uh, uh, Elena recently, that you can do a very good job without knowing VCB. And I think in particular now, where the charm with this, this HPQCD is getting the results. You can basically get all prediction for RK, the case and B without knowing VCB and actually even gamma. I mean, you, <laughs> this is, I wanted to make a point. So now, sorry, I gave another lecture. I stop now. Well, I, thanks for that. I think this is very interesting on, on this abyss view, which of course uh, would add uh, a lot. I, I, I've not 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 um, the, I thought I could look at the latest paper and uh, but uh, yeah I mean I, I I also do very simple fit eh? so don't 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 think that we did with and, and I think also we have to be careful in extrapolating too much the too much information on the on the on the data but I think indeed Bisa Best Mimu it's a, is a very clean and uh, interesting uh, probe so that's a uh, very interesting to to hear. Okay, uh, there's another question from uh, uh, some data. You can unmute yourself. By the way, I'm trying to remove my hand and I fail. Yeah. <laughs> I <don't know> <laughs> so I'm not, uh, I'm not asking again. <laughs> there is something not working. <laughs> okay, Hello? can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, I suppose the entire exercise of this process is to figure out exactly what what particle is mediating these interactions. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, is 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 there is there consensus leading? towards that goal? I mean, is, is there consensus leading towards the goal that there's some single particle that is mediating all these, uh, say... Well, I think, I think uh, it's never really a single particle. So maybe I, I have to be careful here. I think there is a consensus that, I think there is, I would say, very general consensus that if you want to do both type of anomalies, the neutral current and the charged current, you need the laptop work field because otherwise you really have trouble with the basic mix. And this is completely general. Laptop work. Laptop work can be one or can be more. There is no general consensus that is one. I think the model where there is a leading one, which is this U1, I think is interesting, but it's not the only option. For instance, David has a very nice model with, with two scalar laptop work. So I think that is also interesting which would point to a different direction where maybe these scalar laptop work are, are a number of Gaussian boson or pseudo number of Gaussian boson of, of a broken symmetry. This, I think it's a, is another interesting option, absolutely. Uh, there is a question uh, in the chat. Uh, we are read it uh, <clears throat> by uh, Diane and uh, it's about, uh, so uh, do you want laptop work? Um, he asks, uh, it is not normalizable, so how can you make sense uh, oh, at the loop level? So I agree, indeed. 
<clears throat> if you treat it, the EFT level is not normalizable, but uh, this is why we go to a full UV completion, which is completely renormalizable, which is this as you extended for three to one model or, or extended as you for model there, you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking is exactly like the W. So you get the mass from a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the theory is perfectly normalizable. If you treat it only at the EFT level, there are certain observable you can compute because they are infrared dominated, even beyond three level, like for instance, the correction to, to tau decays. But other observable you cannot compute, like uh, KK bar mixing or B bar mixing. So, of course, if you only do at EFT level, at some point you have to stop. That's why I think it's important in this, and especially if you have a, a massive vector, a massive vector in the TV domain, you have to provide the UV completion. And this is what we do with the with the SU4 extended theories. Okay. Uh... I don't see any question and it's quite late. So I think we can stop here. Uh, for other questions, which uh, uh, if you came up with the questions later, uh, you, there is a chat, there is a, a form in Google that uh, you can put a question and maybe uh, Gino sometimes can, can uh, in case we can go and ask. Yes, I would be happy. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for attending. It was a very interesting uh, colloquium. Thank you, Gino, for again. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I put too much material. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.